Thanks very much for coming to my talk. My name's Dr. Eleanor Jones and I work for Ferro Science Limited. And today I want to present some results that are based on a study we did recently of the diet of the Asian hornet in the UK. Although this is Asian Hornet Week, I thought it might be worthwhile giving a brief introduction to the Asian Hornet. So the Asian Hornet is an invasive species that arrived into Europe sometime around 2004, we believe, and it arrived in France. Since then, it's managed to spread across much of Western Europe, and it occasionally arrives into the UK since about 2016. So far, we don't have any evidence that there's a current resident population, so nests are found and then destroyed, and there's no evidence that there's a successful population that persists from year to year. The Asian hornet is often discussed as being a specialist predator of honeybees, but there's good evidence it's a generalist as well, which is able to take um, insects and other animals and carry in and exploit the food sources that are available locally. If it does establish a large population in the UK, it's likely that this is going to have an impact on apiculture and it may also have an impact on the wider biodiversity. And a quick re recap of Asian hornet biology. The adult hornets themselves don't actually feed on uh, the insects that they catch, they feed on sugar rich fluids and the insects they catch, they take back to the nest and feed the larvae. I just have a picture here of the um, life stages of a honeybee, but the, uh, the life stages of the Asian hornet are very similar. So the female will lay an egg, the egg turns in, hatches out a larva, the adult hornets in this case, not bees, will feed up the larvae until it reaches a very large size. Once it reaches that size, it then has, it then voids the st its stomach contents as a single meconian pellet and it then starts the process of pupating and turning into an adult. This is also illustrated here with a photo taken of some frozen Asian hornet nest held at Ferra and you can see these larvae have become extremely large uh, and are probably ready to get into that pupating stage. They've got their tiny little heads here and the adults would have been coming and feeding them uh, mashed up bits of insect they'd caught in the wider countryside. Obviously it'd be very interesting to know what the Asian hornet is eating once it's in the UK. And we have some information from observations made by UK bee health inspectors and by um, beekeepers. Uh, and there's also a, a number of other European studies. The most relevant study is probably the one recent study by Quintin Rome and others where they caught uh, Asian hornets as they returned to the nest and they would then steal the prey item from the hornet and try and identify what it was either from morphology or using DNA methods and they got a, a total of about 2,100 uh, individual prey items and identified those. It's got a comprehensive and complicated data set but one of the key things that comes out is that honeybees is the single largest number of prey items if you identify everything down to species and then there's also large numbers of wasps and grouped together the flies also make up a large proportion of the diet and then they also predate quite a range of other things including carrion so they are taking a lot of honeybees but they're also predating quite a lot of other things as well Coming back to the situation in the UK, there have now been quite a number of nests that have been recovered. And these nests have been found primarily by beekeepers and then located, the actual location of the nest has been figured out by the UK bee health inspectors. The nests are then uh, destroyed and the rem nest remains are then sent in to Ferra. And there's just a photo here that illustrates one of those nests somebody uh, held by a scientist and it's been sliced in two so you can see one of the cones. Those white silken caps are caps over the top of the um, cells where the adult, the newly formed adults are going to emerge. So there's quite a number of these nests held in the freezers at Ferro Science 
and we wanted to do a study of what those nests had been preying on. DEFRA kindly agreed to fund this study and the principle that we took was to have a look at the larval sample, so the larvae that have been eating the prey that's been brought back to the nest, and try and figure out what it is that they've been eating. So the method we took was called DNA metabarcoding. So if you imagine um, an adult Asian hornet has gone out, it's caught uh, a prey item, it's packaged that up, it's snipped off various little bits, and it carries back a bundle of flesh and it feeds that into uh, a larva that itself has a fairly, fairly good jaws. So the, the, the prey item has now been completely mangled. There's no way of really identifying what that prey item was by looking at what's left inside the larva. So we have to use other methods. That prey item is still going to have a lot of its DNA left in it. So we can use that DNA to try and figure out what it was. So we're using a DNA based method to try and identify the prey items. The workflow was um, just illustrated here. So the first picture, this is a picture of an Asian hornet larva. We only used the largest larvae. The small ones were just quite fiddly. So we predominantly took the largest ones. We, uh, if you have a look at this larva, there are dark patches along it and there's a line. And so this larva has got a tiny little head at the top and then most of it is quite a mushy body and then inside is a very extensive stomach. If you remember back to the beginning of the talk, uh, the, this is everything that the larva has ever, ever eaten, apart from obviously the things that have been digested away. The, so we dissect out the stomach and then we take a scoop of that stomach contents and put it into a tube and we extract the DNA from that scoop of stomach contents. Once we've got the DNA that just comes from the prey items, we then amplify up a bit of the DNA that we call the barcode region. So we, we get lots of copy of, that, of the DNA from the prey and we then read it using a sequencer and we used a minion, hence the slightly amusing to scientists illustration there. Once we have all the DNA as data files, we can then go to a library of DNA sequences that other people have created or that we ourselves have created from identified samples. And we can use it to look up what those DNA sequences that have come from the larval gut are. And that by that way, we can identify what it was that the larva had been fed on. This method is called DNA metabarcoding. So what did we find? Well, the first result was when we looked through all the samples we had, we had nests, four nests that available to us that had at least 10 larvae each. So we took 10 larvae from four different nests. I'm going to just present the results for each nest separately. And then at the end, I'm going to give a synthesis of what it is we can take home from the open wall study. And the results were all presented in the same way. So this is a bar chart and it's got 10 bars stacking up vertically. Each bar represents an individual larva and the bar is broken down by colour and that is the proportion of DNA reads that, are, that belong to a particular species. Sometimes we can't get things to species so it's a bit complicated that sometimes it's actually back to an insect family or an insect genus, and sometimes it's all the way to species. But the more different colours there are, the more different things we found inside the larva. If you look at the second bar, just to illustrate what's going on here, this, it is all in one colour, it's in a light green colour, and those are all Asian hornet sequences. So that sample has gone wrong for some reason. The only DNA we've managed to recover from that sample is Asian hornet. It's not that the larva has been fed on Asian hornet, we're probably just getting the DNA from the larva itself. So that's not a very typical result. If you look across the other ones, there's no, the hornet's larvae are being fed different things. 
and the things we're recovering from them uh, is not always the same. One thing to note is the, the amount that belongs to a particular colour does tell you something about um, how much it's been fed on that particular one, but it's DNA read count, it's the number of sequences, it's not directly linked to the number of individuals or anything of a particular prey item. I've highlighted in orange the honeybee Apis mellifera and one thing you can take from the TEDBRI results is that the proportion well, the, of DNA reads that belong to honeybee that we recover from the Asian hornet larvae is actually very low. It's not a major prey item in any of those larvae that we looked at. Instead, what seems to be dominating is this pale blue colour, which in for this tepri nest is the our wasps, probably the European wasp, uh, Vespula germanica. There's also in dark blue, so a fly species. And then in the sort of paley, uh, the third item down, uh, sort of grey blue, there's um, a spider, there's a garden spider. And then there's a var variety of other things that you could tease out from this. But if we just take the headlines, it's there's a lot of wasp sequence, there's not that much honeybee. Um, and then there's quite a variety of other things as well. And also featuring right at the bottom is um, Aeronaeus europaeus, which is actually the European hedgehog, which is quite interesting. Moving on to one of the other nests we recovered. This was a nest that was um, we were we dissected that came from Alderney, so it's not the mainland UK. And in this case, there is no European, uh, there is no European honeybee at all that we found. We only managed to get six successful samples from this. So although we managed, we took 10 larval samples, only of six of them actually amplified up DNA. The, so there's an absence of European honeybee in this one, but there is, again, in pale blue, there is a lot of wasp sequence as well. And then there's other sequences that belong to flies. And also there is um, a moth, which we presume is probably the caterpillar rather than the actual moth stage itself. And a collection of other things, including some spiders. Going on to the Woolacum nest. This worked very nicely as well, rather like Tetbury. We, we did 10 samples and we got data for 10 samples, which is very nice. And there's highlighted again, I've just circled all of the B results. And in this case, there's quite a lot of B DNA turning up consistently. So each larva has had a bit of B, um, which fits with the idea that these things feed on bees. But again, there's quite a lot of other things that isn't B. There's spiders, there's flies and there's wasps again. And then the final nest, which is the most recent one, this is the Gosport nest. Um, from a technical point of view, one of the interesting things about this nest is that although we took 10 samples, we only managed to get data back from three of them. Uh, and we wonder if this is to do with um, how the samples have been used. These Gosport samples were used for something else and then they were used for this. So they went in and out the freezer a couple of times. And that seems to be enough to have knocked back the amount of DNA inside the larva and just to make the methods fail. And it sort of illustrates how careful one has to be with the samples if, if we, you want to do this kind of study. Again, honeybee turns up, but at very low levels. Otherwise, sort of the, if you look at proportion of DNA reads, there's an awful lot of wasp in there and flies. And again, there's a few um, spider sequences again as well. And then there's this thing that has turned up in quite a number of the samples. That's just a big category of uncultured bacterium. Not entirely sure what these come from. We think these might actually be bacteria that are associated probably with the Asian hornet itself. So if you have a look at the overall results, I just have there's a table here that shows the relative pooling everything together, the relative abundance of 
DNA reads that identify to a particular um, species or species group. And what comes out very clearly is that for the samples that we have from the UK, wasp comes out as a major, major item of prey. There's also high up on the list, there's spider. And that might be to do with the amount of eating that you can get out of a spider, possibly. Um, but it does seem to be contributing quite a lot to the diet. And there's a collection of other um, of other flies as well. And honeybee also comes up in the quite high up the list as well. So all of the nests are taking wasps and spiders and they seem to be predating quite a range of medium sized invertebrates. If you look down the list and look up what these things are, they all fit approximately in the same um, size range. Um, but it's worth putting these uh, results in context. Um, if you think how large an Asian hornet nest can grow, so thousands of individuals, taking 10 larvae is quite a small sample to represent the diversity of what's been eaten by the nest. So the number of samples in each nest is quite small, which is a bit of a feature of this kind of study. And also um, there aren't that many larval samples that we have available to us. So the sampling itself might not be particularly representative of what the nest is eating, um, which might distort the finding somewhat. But it's also worth bearing in mind that these nests themselves are really quite odd. So the female hornets have probably arrived in the UK as overwintering females. They may be making their nests quite late in the season. The nests themselves might not be particularly typical of Asian hornet nests. And they're also Asian hornet nests that are entirely on their own in a landscape that has no other Asian hornets. So in places like France, where the Asian hornet is well established, there may be quite a lot of competition for resource, which means that they eat far more honeybees, for example. And so we might expect the diet of the Asian hornet as it first arrives into, the into a particular location to be very different from the diet that it has um, once the Asian hornet is well established. But either way, they're quite interesting results. In addition to the main results, one of the features of these kind of DNA studies is there's always the interesting bits at the bottom. So you have the main prey items and then as you read down the list and you get towards the things where there's not very many DNA sequences, there's all sorts of oddities in there as well. And one of these, um, well, I've just picked out a couple of them. The, one of them is that we were picking up things that are very small. So we had fruit flies in there and we had mosquitoes. And it seems quite unlikely that an Asian hornet would take its time. I mean, it's possible it might stop and have a go to mosquito. But we also wondered whether um, these things could be prey of something else that itself has been eaten. So in the case of the mosquitoes, they turned up in samples where there were also garden spiders. And what we think is happening is that the garden spiders have caught, for example, a mosquito. They've eaten the mosquito and then they themselves have been captured and eaten by Asian hornets. And when we look just at the DNA, we're recovering the DNA, not just of the spider, but also of the thing that was inside the spider, in this case, the mosquito. So we're getting a sort of wider food web of what was going on in the environment. Another thing that we had quite a small proportion of, but it was definitely there in the sample, was um, hedgehog, which we very much hope is an example of Asian hornets taking carrion rather than anything more sinister. A final finding that was quite fun was that in the Tepri samples, uh, we could find very small reads, uh, DNA reads of prawns, which seemed slightly surprising initially. So Asian hornets are known to have fed on prawns and the Tet River nest was one of the first nests that was the first nest that was discovered on the UK mainland. The plant, uh, the inspectors were using prawns as bait to try and lure the adult Asian hornets in, in order to be able to trace them back to the nest. And what we think we're recovering is that actual bait 
So the the bait was put out, it was collected by Asian hornets, fed to the larvae, and then however many years later we recover the DNA from those prawns in our in this study, which is quite quite a nice finding. So in conclusion, well, I've kept this one fairly brief. I think for us, the principal conclusion is that these DNA methods seem to work well. The results seem consistent with what we might expect. There may be quite, there are surprising aspects to it, but we're confident that the DNA we've recovered is capturing the DNA that's present in those larvae. So as a method, it's something that could be used in the future as well. The, the findings might not be, have been exactly as we thought, given that these Asian, Asian hornets are found because they're feeding on honeybee nests and beekeepers are spotting them. We would have expected, I think, to have found a bit more honeybee DNA in those samples. But if there's anything that we can take out of that is that the, the Asian hornets seem in the UK to be quite flexible in the diet they use and they seem to be generalists. If there's any commonality, it's around size and availability of particular prey. But with that caveat that they, these nests in the UK might not be typical of what the nests will be like should the Asian hornet ever establish in the UK, and our sample sizes um, were pretty small. There are, um, Exeter University is doing a study using similar methods, and so if there are findings of Asian hornets in the next year or so in the UK, it's likely that um, they will be, uh, those, the same kind of study will be done on those nests, which is nice. This is very much not my own work. Uh, we would not have any samples to work from if it wasn't for the efforts of the beekeepers and of the APHA inspectors and of APHA more widely to find these things, coordinate the response, bring these things back. Without the funding of DEFRA, none of this would happen either, either the wider response nor the this individual study. And just touching on the, the project itself, this work is very much done by a team um, of Ferris staff who br all bring their specialisms and expertise to help this thing happen. And also um, thanks go to Kirsty Stainton at Purbright, who used to be in the B, uh, B group at Ferrer. And thank you all very much for listening.